southern trees bear a strange fruit blood on the Mary Flannery O'Connor was born March 25, 1925 to Edward and Regina Klein O'Connor in Savannah, Georgia. As an only child, she was very close to both of her parents. Her parents, devout Catholics in a predominantly Protestant city, instilled their faith strongly within Flannery. All of her work intrinsically includes allusions to her deep faith in the Catholicism and her belief in the mysticism of God. After briefly living in Atlanta, the family settled in Milledgeville in 1940. In 1941, Flannery's beloved father died of the genetic disease lupus. Flannery graduated from Georgia State College for Women in 1945. The college is now referred to as the Georgia College and State University. After graduation, she attended a writer's workshop program at the University of Iowa, which is where she received her Master's of Fine Arts in 1947. While at Iowa, Flannery wrote her first collection of short stories entitled The Geranium. In 1949, Flannery moved to New York and worked with the artist group Yaddo. She met the Fitzgeralds there and moved with them to Connecticut, where she lived with the couple while she penned her first novel, Wise Blood. Flannery moved back to Milledgeville in 1951 because she began showing signs of lupus, the disease that killed her father. For the next 13 years, she lived on the family farm until she died in 1964 at the young age of 39. According to Craig Amison, the executive director of the Flannery O'Connor Andalusia Foundation, Flannery's biggest literary influence in her writing was Edgar Allan Poe. Her sense of biting humor and quirky behavior, in fact, is very reminiscent of Poe. In Brad Gooch's biography of Flannery, he tells us some of her uniqueness, such as drinking Coca-Cola mixed with coffee, raising peacocks and other fowls, and teaching a chicken to walk backwards. Her love of the peacock stems from its religious symbolism of the immortal and incorruptible soul. Flannery herself jokingly explains her writing regime. She says, I write from 9 a.m. to noon each day. I spend the rest of my day recovering from it. Her favorite pastime was caring for her beloved peacocks and walking around her farm Andalusia. Southern Gothic literature authors strongly rely on a sense of place in their stories, and her peafowls and farm are present in all of her works. During the 13-year period before Flannery died, she wrote two novels, Wise Blood and The Violent Bear It Away, and two additional collections of short stories titled A Good Man is Hard to Find and Everything That Rises Must Converge. Everything That Rises Must Converge was published after her death and contains in its collection the short story Revelation. The short story of Revelation centers around a small town doctor's waiting room that is full of people from all walks of life. Mrs. Turpin, our narrator, who is waiting for her husband Claude to be seen by the doctor, struggles with identifying herself in the different classes of people. Themes of racial tension among the southern states did not end with the Confederates' defeat following the Civil War. Yet race should not simply be thought of as an issue of black and white. Mrs. Turpin tells us about a family of white trash that is present in the waiting room. White trash is a vague race lumped together indiscriminately as the poor whites. Mrs. Turpin's attitude towards African Americans in the obscure class of white trash further illustrates this strife among classes and she gives us a view of the class system in which she subscribes to us. On the bottom of the heap were most colored people. Not the kind she would have been if she had been one, but most of them. Then next to them, not above, just away from them, were the white trash. Then above them were the homeowners, and above them the home and landowners, to which she and Claude belonged. And she and Claude were people with a lot of money and much bigger houses and much more land. Religion is a very vital part of the Southern culture. 
Mrs. Turpin struggles to identify her individual race and rectify that identity with her religious faith. This leads us on a journey that ends with Mrs. Turpin's revelation. It's an eye-opening moment for Mrs. Turpin when she discovers that her old Southern values must evolve and accept the New South principles of equality and faith. Our antagonist of the story is Mary Grace. Mrs. Turpin introduces us to Mary Grace with a less than flattering picture. However, as Mrs. Turpin finds out, Mary Grace is merely a vessel in which God, the true antagonist, speaks directly to her. Fed up with Mrs. Turpin's musings on the different classes and culture, Mary Grace throws her aptly titled Human Development book straight at Mrs. Turpin and hits her in the head. When Mrs. Turpin confronts her, Mary Grace tells her, go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. Mrs. Turpin's revelation brings her to see the world as accepting and loving despite what we do and do not have. She sees signs that the South is changing around her, from the African Americans who can now own land, to the demand for equal pay, to the request for fair treatment in the work setting. Mrs. Turpin has shown examples of how the Southern values that she holds dear are changing, and she must change with them. Race, religion, and the revelation of Mrs. Turpin's environment changing are major themes throughout Revelation. O'Connor's journey through the changes of what was the Old South leads the reader to see clearly why change is needed. As Mrs. Turpin comes to terms with seeing herself not as an extension to her community, but rather as a self-actualized person, we are reminded that we are part of a cosmic whole, not just a little town of the South.